And uh, the title of this panel is The Confiscation of American Prosperity. And, and the uh, panelists are uh, Michael Hudson, um, from the Levin Institute, um, uh, Michael Perlman from the University of California, uh, Chico, and myself, Hugo Rato from San Francisco College. Uh, and as I was saying, I was a member of uh, the steering committee of the Union for Radical Political um, Economy, uh, which is uh, one of the sponsors of this panel and the other one, Science and Society. Uh, this program will be uh, made available online at uh, that place, Open Union of the Left dash YouTube, in a couple of days or so. Okay, so uh, we have until 11.15 uh, a.m. So we're going to uh, allow for each of us, each of the speakers, uh, a 20 minute uh, presentation and then we will open the, uh, uh, the, the space for interaction and also for participation of the audience. So we're going to start with uh, Michael Perlman. Michael Perlman who proposed the title of this panel on the basis of one of his books. I proposed it, the tenth subject, because of my book, which was, I thought, the best book I've ever written. Is, it, is the microphone not working? No. no. Maybe you need to pull it closer. Get closer. Is working better? Yeah. Better, yes. Why don't you pull it up? Okay. I'll try this. Yay. Anyway, I intended to write a paper about the book which I thought was the best book I've ever done. The publisher buried it. And there you go. Oh, no, that's a <laughs> yeah. no. The publisher buried it with an exorbitant price and the most ridiculous cover ever put on a book. The book was written as the story, a crime story where I started with the caper in which... What's the name of your book? The Confiscation of American Prosperity. Okay. I would get in trouble if I told you that it would be easy to find online. So I would never do that. And I'm sure all of you are very law-abiding citizens for whom that would not tempt you to do anything illegal. the same month that the stock market burned down. But it remains virtually unread. Then I decided to do something different for this. And since we're all patriotic, I want to start out with the Star, Star, Star Spangled Banner. You're all familiar with the Star Spangled Banner. Or maybe you're not. How many, how many of you are familiar with this stanza? Don't worry, I won't sing it. <laughs> no refuge could save the hireling and the slave from the terror of fight, flight or the gloom of the grave. Now keep in mind, this, this has to do with the Second Amendment. The militias that they were talking about were the militias for catching slaves. The Star Spangled Banner was written during the War of 1812, and it was a time when the Americans were very upset because the Canadians were not returning 
their private property. They treated them almost as if they were human beings. And that infuriated the Americans, which is part of the reason for the War of 1812. Now the story that I'm telling in this, in this talk is the story of how Southern slave owner ideology morphed into what we now call neoliberalism. And in a sense, that seems appropriate because the neoliberals would like all the working people to be indistinguishable from slaves. Part of, part of the slave ideology was that labor had to be kept in line. And in neoliberalism, this turns into wage suppression, the destruction of unions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem is The problem is that this neoliberal ideology doesn't work, and the slave ideology doesn't work. They are a recipe for backwardness. In fact, when we look at history, what we see is when labor becomes scarce, then you see a rapid round of technological change and progress. So for example, during the Black Death, when about one third of the population of Europe disappeared, suddenly there was a period of prosperity. There were fewer people who were trying to rent land, so rent became cheap. There were fewer people ready to work, so wages went up. And it turns out that that was a period of rapid technological change. Richard C. Allen, a very important historian, made the case that in the late 19th century, when there were wars breaking out all over, labor became scarce for a different reason. The young men were being killed instead of working in factories. And again, because of that, it set off what we now know as the Industrial Revolution. Another historian, H.J. Habakkuk, wrote a fantastic book describing American technology early in our history. And it was always the scarcity of labor making for rapid technological change. And people who came here from other countries and looked at it were amazed by the rapid technological change which had to do, again, with the scarcity of labor, which meant high wages, which meant people had to get smart. And you see that, how pressure makes technological change occur. One of the things to note, when the stock market melted down after 2007, you'd pick up the paper, you'd see more unemployment, but you'd also see labor productivity is increasing, because competitive pressures we're forcing business to either get more efficient or get out of the game. Now slavery, it overcame the, um, the South overcame the shortage of labor by hauling in people from Africa. But it never worked. <clears throat> it never worked because they didn't have the need to modernize. Well, in fact, they did modernize. They modernized in terms of the technology required for the cotton production and transportation. So there were some interesting machines, but none of that spilled over into the rest of the economy. There was a man named Frederick Olmsted who designed Central Park, who was a, a 
person who wrote letters to Karl Marx, and uh, he did a book, a very interesting book, in which he traveled through the southern states. And he compared the productivity of the southern states to the northern states and saw that the South was backward in every way that you can imagine. Nonetheless, the concentration of wealth in the United States was located in the South. The slave owners were very sophisticated people. They were educated in Europe, or their children would be educated in Europe, and they were enormously wealthy. Now, this split between the North and the South, that turned up in a paper called the Constitution. And the Constitution was constructed in a way to make happy the slaveholding part of the country. First of all, they wanted to make the government as weak as possible because they feared that the American government, like the English government, might outlaw slavery. So they had all sorts of checks and balances. Superimposed on that, they constructed the Constitution so that the southern states were overrepresented. Black people weren't people, they couldn't vote, but they counted as three-fifths of a person and they figured out how much representation each state would have. Just as today, states get extra representation in Congress depending upon how many prisons they have in their state. So they take black people and poor people from central cities where they might be inclined to do bad things like vote for Democrats, and they put them in prisons, and it means the votes of the remaining people count more. Putting two senators from every state in the Electoral College also increased the representation of southern states. Now, on the ideological front, Samuel Johnson wrote an essay in response to a congressional statement that taxes British taxes were tyranny. So Johnson wrote an essay called Taxation No Tyranny, an answer to resolutions and address of the American Congress. And Samuel Johnson asked the obvious question. How is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? That is, that's where American libertarianism comes from, the slave drivers. Did you say that principle? Did you just say that concept once Oh, the concept was that libertarianism today comes from the ideology of the slave drivers. And it was ideology so that the government would not have any ability to interfere with property, and since the slaves were property, it would ensure the continuation of slavery. There's a fantastic book written in 1975 by Edmund Morgan, and it's called American Slavery, American Freedom, and he expands on what Johnson saw. In Virginia, there was a big call for liberty, liberty, liberty. And we remember that most of our early presidents are coming from Virginia. And at the same time, these libertarians are owning slaves. Washington, Jefferson, and so on. One of the most interesting takes on this came from a man named Sir James Stewart, a contemporary of Adam Smith and a much deeper economist and a much less read economist because he saw that capitalism was an ideal form of slavery. He was in favor of it, but he saw that capitalism and slavery were quite similar. And what he said was, in the past, men were forced to labor because they were slaves to others. Men are now forced to labor because they're slaves to their own wants. 
And this so infuriated the British that he was very, very unread. And years later, he wrote somebody and he said, if I had written a biography of my poor departed dog, it would have been twice as long and many times more read. So his book was just, and yet even the people who criticized it and said the book was no good would say he's really brilliant and he has this great knowledge, but don't read it. Is that Stuart with a U or a W? Pardon? Is it Stuart with a U or a W? E-U-A-R-T, S-T-E-U-A-R-T. Okay. Very he strange. didn't want to be confused with the uh, Now, a counter-argument was developing in the United States. There was a man named David A. Wells who was a technician. He helped construct and, and uh, lay out factories. And during the Civil War, he became in charge of taxation. And he also became the person who would select those people who would have the most responsibility in terms of the economy. He would be the ones who would select they're the good ones, this one, that one. And he was a strict protectionist. And he took a trip to England. And he saw that the American factories, again because of high wages, were more efficient than the English factories. The English factories tended to uh, emphasize durability of equipment. And Americans didn't put money into durability. They wanted to be able to renew it and get the latest and best, like kids with their iPhones today. I've got to get this next one. Uh, but anyway, he then came back and he said, you know, we don't have anything to worry about from pauper labor. That is, the underpaid labor of the Europeans. Because our high wages will ensure great technology. And in fact, Wells even anticipated and used examples almost identical to what Schumpeter would use more than a half century later with creative destruction, which you may have heard of. And Wells' idea came to be a doctrine that was widely accepted by economists. It was called the economy of high wages. And this is, this is held in the United States economy. Well, I've only talked five minutes. That's good. <laughs> so I got a lot of time left. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, this idea was held even by Herbert Hoover who we mostly think of as a you know, crazy conservative, which he was in many respects. Now this, this kind of, of economy of high wages was at the heart of the beginning of the National Bureau of Economic Research of all places, which is now the fortress of conservative economics today. Incidentally, the uh, prize for the best dissertation in economics at Harvard University is called the David A. Wells Prize. What happened was, during the First World War, government became very, very strong. In many ways, unwarrantedly so. And this set off a big push to reignite this proto-neoliberalism. This is when you get Calvin Coolidge and back to normal. Normal meant weak government. And uh, this gave rise to the freedom of the great of the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, and the Roaring Twenties roared out with the Great Depression. The Great Depression gave a bad smell to neoliberalism of the time and opened the door to Keynes. Keynesian economics was temporarily in charge. When I went to, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Mich Michigan in the 1950s, everybody was a Keynesian and I remember when the professors were all going to go 50 miles west to Michigan State and hear this crazy guy talk and I had never heard the name Milton Friedman before. 
but he's, he was regarded as some simpleton. He wasn't a simpleton, but he was, his stuff was very damaging. So then we get back um, with the golden age. The golden age of capitalism was when you did have a strong government after the New Deal and you had higher wages and that worked really well until the Vietnam War unraveled it. The Vietnam War put all sorts of pressures on. Barry Goldwater runs for office, soundly defeated. The right wing organizers most famously beginning with a letter from Lewis Powell in which he was talking about the great enemies of America and the two great enemies <laughs> were Ralph Nader, who was in favor of small business, and the evil one, Martin Luther King. And that gave rise to the Cato Foundation, the, uh, uh, all of these right wing uh, heritage groups, these right wing legal foundations and the like. And that was the power that I talk about in the confiscation of American prosperity that caused the whole economy to unravel. And we have a system now where all the benefits of growth don't trickle down, they trickle up. How many more minutes? Well, then I'll take the minute to thank you for not falling asleep or throwing anything at me. And uh, I had fun. <laughs> talking uh, with, uh, on the same conference as Michael because we have the same uh, points of reference. Uh, William Petty, uh, James Stewart. Uh, I bought a copy of James Stewart, Principles of Political Economy. It was the first uh, book to use that title. Uh, a photo offset made in Japan in World War II. You couldn't get the original anymore, but the Japanese were all reprinting these uh, page by page. Uh, and uh, uh, it actually turned out to be rarer the, uh, than the original. Uh, in, uh, I might as well begin my talk with uh, the American Revolution. Uh, as a Britisher pointed out to me in, uh, when I uh, was in school in the 50s, in 1776, uh, the annual register of England, it's, uh, if you go into the public library, at least if you used to, there's a long uh, shelf of uh, the main publication in England, which was official publication, the annual register, <coughs> in that you have uh, congratulatory uh, messages from uh, the British uh, liberals all congratulating the American revolutionists for continuing uh, the glorious revolution, the British revolution against the vested interests. So they certainly viewed the American revolution as part of uh, their own political fight uh, within England. And if you read the writings of the early uh, American revolutionists, their ideal was really a very bourgeois ideal. It's uh, every man should have his own land and his own slaves if you're in the South. Uh, and basically it was one of uh, uh, pre-industrial uh, sort of uh, feudalism without uh, the vested interests, with everybody owning the own land rather than absentee ownership, uh, uh, without uh, uh, predatory banking, without uh, monopolies. Uh, well, Europe finally had its own revolution in 1848, uh, and that uh, aimed at uh, freeing capitalism, industrial capitalism, from the two major legacies of feudalism. Uh, landlordism, uh, absentee landlords that extracted land rent, uh, and uh, you, the banking uh, based on usury instead of uh, industry. Uh, when Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto uh, in 1848, he said the historical destiny of capitalism was to sweep away what he called the excrescences of added costs that uh, had uh, price without value empty income that was unnecessary. What today is called rentier income. Land rent, monopoly rent, and financial interest. Uh, Marx thought that the land uh, uh, problem would be caused, uh, cured, by nationalizing land, raw materials, resources, uh, uh, and uh, later uh, some people suggested just taxing the land rent. Marx thought that banking would be cured uh, by uh, industrial capitalism 
for the first time mobilizing banking to finance industry, to industrialize banking, uh, along the lines that Saint-Simon uh, was uh, proposing in France and uh, the lines that were being developed even in Marx's day in Germany into the Reichsbank uh, and the great uh, German banks that uh, uh, took an equity as well as a debt position in their customers and uh, helped uh, Ger German capitalism overcome industrial capitalism. Uh, and as for monopolies, Marx thought, well, uh, we, the in destiny of industrial capitalism is to take them into the public domain and uh, basically to provide basic services freely uh, or at cost, just like roads uh, or education uh, in his day. But of course, Marx criticized the 1848 revolution because he said once they do all these things, once they free industri industrial capitalism, from rent and interest and monopoly rent, uh, you're still going to have the exploitation of labor. Uh, and what he added to value theory was saying that not only is rentier income, rent and interest exploitative, but as all of you know here, uh, uh, industrial profits are based on paying labor less than uh, the amount uh, that it produces. And uh, so in capital, uh, Marx uh, developed what was in his day the first business cycle theory, uh, saying uh, underconsumption or overproduction resulting from the fact that workers weren't given enough to, uh, uh, to, to buy uh, the products of what they produced. So uh, subsequently to that, for the next uh, uh, 50, year, 60 years, the entire Marx movement has been basically following what Marx developed in volume one. Uh, of capital, uh, the uh, fight between wage labor and the employees, and he said that's the characteristic, as you know, of industrial capitalism, it's based on wage labor. Uh, now you can fast forward today. Uh, it turns out that Marx was wrong when uh, he was overly optimistic of capitalism. He thought that capitalism was going to sweep, sweep away land rent, sweep away interest, sweep away uh, uh, profits and somehow lead to a more uh, productive economy. And he thought that the brains of, uh, in the, of uh, uh, leadership of uh, capitalism was going to be the banks, that they would end up as uh, basically the planning system. And uh, he foresaw that all socialism had to do, pretty much as it was doing in Germany, was take over the banks, uh, democratize government and voters would vote in the self-interest and uh, they would uh, somehow solve these problems. But they haven't solved the problems and today the problems that we're dealing with are really uh, volume two and three of capital problems, not volume one of capital problems. Uh, we're dealing with uh, the economy today, uh, a mathematician would say, we are in the optimum position mathematically uh, of uh, the U.S. economy and Europe, and it doesn't get any better than this. In other words, it's all going to go downhill from here. Uh, we're really stuck, and we're stuck because uh, whatever way we move, you make things worse. That's the definition of optimum. You can't uh, improve your position by moving somewhere. Uh, the great uh, debate now in uh, the financial markets and in the international press is over uh, whether the Federal Reserve is going to stop the quantitative easing policy and let interest rates go up. Uh, and the complaints, uh, and you find it also in the Financial Times, the complaints are if you continue today, zero interest rates of 0.1% is what you get on safe investments in U.S. Treasury bills, uh, then the pension funds are not able to make the 8.5% cumulative return year after year that they need in order to pay the pension. So you're going to have uh, the state and local pensions, corporate pensions, government pensions unable uh, to pay. Somebody is going to have to uh, suffer. Also, the insurance companies that have issued uh, guaranteed incomes and annuities uh, on the assumption that they can make income uh, are, are in trouble, uh, the British insurance companies in particular. Uh, on the other hand, suppose you begin to solve this problem uh, and you raise the interest rates. Uh, if you raise the interest rates, then all of a sudden uh, credit is going to become uh, more expensive to uh, arbitrage. You, you can't borrow as much to buy stock market uh, dividends. Uh, you, you, the plunge protection team uh, that's been supporting the stock prices won't have the money to push them up anymore. 
uh, the, the margin of uh, real estate mortgages, which uh, basically capitalize uh, the uh, land rent or the property rent at the going interest rate, the prices will go down for real estate, capital uh, gains will turn into capital losses, uh, and also, if the, if the interest rates in America go up, then the uh, dollar is going to surge against the euro and against the third world currencies. Uh, third world countries uh, owe most of their foreign debt in dollars, and all of a sudden to pay the foreign debt uh, that they owe, and the, even the domestic debt that they owe that's denominated in dollars, they're going to have to pay much more of their domestic currency, uh, and you will uh, be subjecting them to uh, debt deflation, uh, and there will be a crisis. So basically, the world economy as it is now is stuck, uh, and where is it going to go from here? Now, the, uh, the amazing thing is that here we're in a position where not only labor is threatened by unemployment spreading from uh, uh, America, Europe, uh, and all the countries, uh, uh, you have governments uh, running budget uh, surpluses, or at least in Europe under the terms of the uh, uh, Maastricht rules, uh, you're not allowed to run a budget deficit of more than 3% of GDP, meaning that Europe is prevented uh, if you're in the Eurozone, from uh, deficit spending to uh, pull the economy out of uh, depression. You're not allowed to have government uh, uh, debt in excess of 60% of GDP. Uh, the Euro was designed, basically, as a tool of class war. It was designed to dismantle governments, to prevent governments from having a central bank to finance their own deficit. But, uh, they don't, the European Central Bank is not like the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England. Uh, it doesn't uh, finance government spending directly. It can only buy bonds in the bond market which supports their prices uh, for uh, existing bondholders. So uh, basically, this means that the European economy is entirely dependent upon private bank credit uh, in order to grow. And the problem is twofold. One, private bank credit uh, extracts interest and uh, all sorts of financial fees for what it's doing. And secondly, uh, banks don't lend for the same thing that governments uh, run deficits for. Uh, governments run deficit supposedly to help the economy grow uh, or in, uh, in the past to finance military spending, uh, but banks lend mainly to buy assets that are already in place. Marx, uh, in the examples he used in Capital, he assumed that industrialists were going to borrow uh, money and pay out of the surplus value, uh, maybe a, a profit share, half of the money for interest, half the money for profit. That's what Adam Smith said was a rule of thumb, uh, that the rate of profit was twice the rate of interest, so that uh, if you have that, then uh, the company makes the profit, it gives half to the uh, uh, bondholder banker and uh, keeps half for itself. Well, uh, what's happened today is that uh, the banks in, throughout history have never financed uh, industrial uh, development. Uh, James Watt had to uh, uh, mortgage his house and borrow from friends uh, for the steam engine. Uh, you, uh, hardly any industry has uh, uh, borrows in order to start up. Uh, banks will only lend against either assets in place, they'll give a mortgage on plant and equipment, especially on real estate that the uh, company owns, uh, or it will uh, finance uh, foreign trade and sales out of receivables. If you have an order that's to be paid in three months, they'll finance that. But the financial system has not developed anywhere near along the lines that Marx expected it to. It's become basically predatory. Uh, and uh, you find today uh, criticisms of activist shareholders, leading companies, uh, raiding uh, corporations, and uh, using their money uh, to pay dividends uh, or for stock buybacks. 93% uh, of American profits in the last uh, uh, few years have been used either for stock buybacks uh, or for other uh, financial uh, uses, such as paying dividends, not for uh, new capital investment. So industry has been financialized instead of finance becoming industrialized. Now, uh, in this sense, if you can talk about the American Revolution uh, being a failure, I think we should talk about how the mark, how, where have the left-wing parties gone wrong. In Europe, what the parties that used to be left-wing, the social democratic parties and the labor parties, are on the right wing of the political spectrum. 
further to the right than the conservatives. And that's because, if, just think Tony Blair, or think uh, uh, George Papandreou in Greece. Not only did he impose austerity on Greece, not only did he impose uh, the right-wing uh, policies dictated by the European Central Bank that no right-wing, no conservatives could have done, but uh, he was elected as head of the Socialist International, and then, just as he tightened austerity, he was re-elected as head of the Socialist International. Uh, so uh, you ha have throughout Europe uh, the uh, ostensibly old socialist parties uh, advocating uh, balanced budgets, uh, advocating uh, austerity and being responsible. Uh, two days ago, I got a call from a uh, Washington uh, Democratic Party think tank, uh, wanting, uh, uh, asking me whether I could write something on uh, writing off student uh, debt. And they said, we can't get any left winger who's interested in debt write downs because they say that it's not responsible. Now, this is amazing. How can the, the fight of our time is financial? Uh, not, <coughs> if uh, industrial capitalism is stuck, then so is industrial labor, so is wage labor, uh, all in the same thing. The neoliberalism that's led from the United States, especially led from the, United, from the Democratic Party under Rubenomics, from Clinton to uh, Obama, uh, there, this is as anti-labor, anti-industrial a policy uh, that you can have, and yet the left has bought into it, uh, which is amazing. Uh, and this is a problem that uh, I've had for the last 50 years. Uh, in 1971, I went down to the Institute of Policy Studies, where uh, I had a loose association with, and uh, I asked uh, uh, Mark, uh, Marcus, Marcus, uh, uh, what? Raskin. Yeah, Raskin, uh, to talk about third world debt. Uh, at that time, uh, already the banks uh, in New York, uh, I'd worked for Chase Manhattan Bank as a balance of payments analyst, and I tend to hang out with uh, bankers and fund managers. Everyone was talking about what's called lend, not, lend and pretend. Uh, they were lending money to Brazil, to Argentina. Uh, they were lending them the interest to pay the debt. Uh, and uh, Raskin said, we can't talk about uh, debt, uh, uh, third world debt cancellation because uh, we won't be taken seriously. Uh, I wanted to uh, teach at, at the new school. I was teaching national income accounting uh, using Marx's uh, Theories of Surplus Value uh, is my textbook. And uh, Heilbrunner got furious. Uh, he said, uh, this is all, uh, you're claiming something that's completely obsolete, a distinction between earned and unearned income and productive and unproductive labor. He said, you can't teach it, we're going to fire you if you're going to teach it. So I said, fine. Uh, you know, I'm going to teach it, and I'm going to tell them, you know, that what you're saying is a travesty of Marxism. You know, that what you think is Marxism, is, uh, we call that limousine liberal, I guess a limousine liberal Marxism, and uh, uh, drew the line uh, about it, and uh, uh, left uh, to join the Hudson Institute, where the right wing was very interested in, in learning about imperialism. Uh, the first contract the Institute got was from the Defense Department, uh, $85,000 for me to explain to them my book, Super Imperialism, and how America was exploiting the rest of the world. They used it as a how-to-do-it book. Uh, uh, the so I thought the socialists would be interested, but uh, uh, not, uh, not too much. Uh, when uh, it came out, uh, there was a book by Raskin's uh, partner, uh, Global Reach. Uh, he said, I'm going to have to take out everything uh, that I've written about you uh, in the book because you're, adv you're advocating third world debt cancellation and we're responsible. So my name's in the index, but you won't find me anywhere uh, in the book. This is how somehow there's something that upsets cap uh, socialists and especially Marxists if you criticize landlords, if you criticize bankers, if you criticize the fire sector. And yet the reason that America now is uh, uh, uncompetitive with the rest of the world is clear if you look at the national income statistics uh, in the sense that Marx did. Marx uh, divided, like all other classical economists, he divided uh, the economy into wealth production and real uh, value production versus overhead, rent. And uh, it's today that would be called mainly the fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. Just think of where the American paycheck goes. The largest element is for housing, and I say this in almost all of my lectures. Uh, the U.S. Uh, the Federal Housing Agency guarantees uh, uh, 
government mortgages that will absorb up to 43% of the wage earner's income. Now just imagine, suppose you're paying 43% uh, percent of your income for a government guaranteed mortgage. 15% of your wages are withheld for FICA, uh, Social Security and Medicare. Uh, probably 10% uh, uh, goes for uh, other bank credit card debt and other bank loans and student loans. Uh, and maybe another 15% uh, for other taxes, including the sales taxes that are being shifted on to labor. So uh, this uh, uses, uh, these payments that are not for goods and services end up absorbing 75% of uh, m m many of the wage earners, blue collar uh, workers, uh, income if they're a homeowner. Now just imagine, if, if the, at this high a price, if you would give them all of the food, clothing, and material value for nothing, uh, American labor still could not compete with foreign labor, either in China or anywhere else. Uh, because uh, foreigners, uh, as you know from all the discussions uh, now, they say, oh, look at the uh, Indonesians, they live on uh, $2 a day. Uh, they don't have to pay the average rent in Manhattan of $4,500 a month, I can guarantee you. They don't have the high uh, uh, rent charges. They don't have the high debt charges because uh, nobody will uh, lend money uh, to the poor. Uh, they, uh, education in other countries is free while America is running up education. The banks have found that uh, uh, education is a means of creating debt uh, uh, and giving them free uh, uh, ser uh, services. So you have America uh, building in almost all of the growth. What it, the Federal Reserve and the National Income and Product Accounts report is increasing uh, GDP is actually, it's all overhead. It's not really product at all. And uh, that's, uh, if uh, Marx's theories of surplus value was a whole history of how the uh, uh, Classical economists had distinguished between rent, uh, interest, and uh, uh, profits and actual value. None of this appears in the left. Uh, there's no, uh, basically, there's no alternative uh, presentation of the national income to describe the economy in terms of the way that most of the exploitation is occurring. And most of the exploitation is not occurring in the form of profits, uh, certainly not profits that are re invested in uh, capital production, a new uh, investment, as Marx thought. Uh, it's uh, simply a rake-off, and the rake-off uh, is very much uh, uh, stripping uh, the economy. And uh, th that has left us in the optimum position that we're in today. Uh, we can't move. The uh, only parties that are talking about this are uh, the, the nutty Christ uh, progressive Christian right, and in Europe, the nationalist parties, uh, where is the left in all this? Uh, they've, uh, they have nothing to say. I better leave it here and maybe you can suggest something. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, I am very tempted to raise up to the challenge uh, and uh, reply to some of the remarks that, uh, that Michael uh, just, just made, but I'm going to resist it. So it's not going to be as, as, as interesting as it could be, but, uh, but I'm going to just refer you to the previous uh, one year ago uh, a panel that we also held in, where uh, some of these issues were discussed. Uh, it's on the Open University Uni of the Left YouTube uh, channel. Um, uh, what I'm going to uh, I'm going to do that uh, today uh, is to share with you some reflections that uh, I'm having about an issue that has been uh, recently in the media, uh, in the academic media and the regular uh, you know press, um, the issue of uh, technological change. Um, it's an aspect of this confiscated American prosperity uh, in Michael's, uh, Michael Perlman's uh, book title. Um, I, I, want, I would like to make five points, and because I don't want uh, my speech to uh, divert me from them, I'm going to just state them up front. Uh, the first one is that uh, technological change is not a juggernaut is not a natural phenomenon. Um, 
it is obviously a product of the actions of people. Uh, that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that technological change is an aspect of labor cooperation. So one way of looking at the combination of labor, right, the uh, mutual assistance among workers, one way of looking at it is what we would call technology. And so technological change is the change in that uh, mutual assistance among workers, labor cooperation. Um, the third point that I want to drive home is that technologi technological change offers the promise or the possibility or the potential for human liberation. Uh, it is possible for humans to em emancipate themselves from uh, brutish, uh, repetitive, boring work, uh, to expand the uh, extent of free time, and, uh, and to be concerned about the long-term uh, sustainability of the human race and this planet and the universe. Uh, uh, that, that promise is lodged in uh, technological change. Again, technological change being just one side of what we call uh, labor uh, cooperation. The fourth point is that under the current uh, social institutions, under what we would call capitalism, Technological change uh, is hijacked. It's directed to reinforcing uh, capital at the expense of the rest of us, at the expense of labor, and uh, including, of course, the destruction of nature uh, uh, for uh, uh, the future uh, of the human race. Um, so under capitalism, the fruits of labor cooperation do not go to the producers, to the direct or immediate producers, but they are instead uh, uh, taken away by the owners uh, for their benefit. That's the fourth point. The fifth point is that, uh, sorry, I, I forgot to set this up. Let me, let me just uh, take three minutes out of my time and now so that I can discipline myself. Um, the, uh, the fifth point is that for technological change to fulfill its promise, the promise of assisting uh, us uh, to uh, emancipate ourselves from um, the social structures that historically we have created, that we have produced and that we reproduce every day, uh, for technological change to become our friend, we need to engage in and win the class struggle broadly uh, considered, that we need to uh, reorient uh, production, we need to re reorient technology uh, to serve our needs, to reappropriate uh, the fruits of our labor collectively. So those are the five points. Now let me try and expand a little bit on each of them. The, this idea of uh, technological change as a uh, juggernaut or as an automatic process uh, that is beyond our control, uh, well, it is. It is indeed, uh, it appears that way to us. As individuals, we don't exercise uh, control over uh, 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 the progress of technology because, uh, as I said before, it is uh, now at the service of capital. Uh, the way capital achieves this is because it, withheld, it withholds uh, the physical means of production that are required uh, for labor to, uh, uh, to be able to produce wealth and, uh, and that way it extracts a portion of uh, the product, a portion of the uh, labor uh, and appropriates it privately. So uh, uh, let me mention two of the favorite stories that circulate in the academ academic uh, media um, about uh, technological change. One of them is uh, uh, something that actually has uh, influenced at least uh, some leftists. Uh, in a recent event, the Historical Materialism Conference, I don't know if uh, some of you attended, uh, Michael uh, Hudson was in that panel. Uh, my friend uh, Bertel Ullman, 
from New York University, the political science department. He uh, referred to a study recently published by uh, Oxford economists, I forgot their names. Um, and uh, they, it's a study where they uh, uh, take data for the United States and uh, the Census Bureau has like a list of over 700 different uh, occupations. And, uh, and they studied uh, empirically, they uh, do some uh, statistical number crunching to figure out to which extent these occupations are susceptible to automation or to you know being uh, uh, you know this uh, the, the workers that uh, perform these occupations uh, what is the chance of them being replaced by machines by you know computer controlled machines um, automata things like that robots and things like that networks and uh, and they find that uh, that about. 50% uh, uh, of those uh, of those occupations are uh, are gonna be replaced by machines in the next uh, couple of decades, and um, and so uh, uh, this kind of paints a picture of a future, a very dreadful future of massive uh, structural unemployment or technological unemployment. Right? So it seems like it's nothing that we can do about it because it's embedded in, the, in, in this process that we call technology and technology is something that just happens to us where we uh, don't uh, seem to exercise much of a measure of control over that. That's, that's, that's one of the stories. And um, uh, I actually applaud Paul Krugman, uh, the uh, Nobel Prize economist uh, who uh, writes a column in the New York Times for uh, re rejecting this, this this notion, which is also appears in the following form, you know, in the current conditions, we have a mismatch between the, uh, the skills and the talents of the labor force, and on the other hand, the needs of industry. You know, the kind of uh, talents that production requires are not there. So, as a result, sorry, but we're going to have to do, have unemployment, massive unemployment, right? That that's not going to change unless the labor force undergoes this very painful process of retraining, etc. Therefore, focus on, you know, retraining of the of the workers, etc. And uh, Paul Krugman has been saying that's that's BS. You know, that's that's really a, a, it's an excuse for austerity policies. You know, it's like you see unemployment. That's not because of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, because of the lack, for example, of investment or public investment, or you know, a more uh, vigorous fiscal policy. But it's simply a, a fact of life that you have to accept, and um, uh, yeah, that, that's one of the forms in which it currently appears. The other, the other story is is, is more uh, academic, and it's this dispute among some economists about the nature of of technical change, all framed within this conventional uh, conventional economic uh, set of theories, right? What some people uh, in the left call neoclassical economics. Uh, uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's a story about whether uh, technical change right, uh, uh, is a skill bias or not, and to what extent is a skill bias. What is this? Well, <clears throat> the way economists look at it is uh, uh, in order to produce something, for example, a cake or a pie, uh, you need, uh, yes, I'm, I'm taking that into, uh, I have it here. Uh, uh, in order to make a pie, you need uh, certain ingredients, right? You need objects such as, you know, eggs and flour and things like that, a kitchen uh, with an oven, a space for it, etc. utensils, bowls. And, um, and, uh, and you also need, of course, uh, the, the maker of the pie, you need labor, right? And, uh, and so technology is, number one, a list of these ingredients or inputs. Uh, number two is a description of the process by which you mix up, you combine these inputs. And number three, a description, as detailed as necessary, right, to guide production, but a description of the finished product. Of the, you need, a, like, like in epicurus.com, you need like a photo of the, uh, uh, of the of the red velvet velvet cake finish right and the, so that it guides the uh, 
the, the tasks of the producer, of the maker, of the pie or the, or the, or the cake. And so technology is a set of ideas, right? It's a set of ideas, right? Three ideas. Number one, the list of the inputs. Number two, the uh, how to mix them up. Number three, the description of the final product. So it's ideas. And, um, and so ideas about how to combine uh, the inputs of production, basically natural resources, uh, physical capital, and labor power in order to produce uh, 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 things that we regard as good. Um, that's what we call technology. And, um, and one of the usual assumptions that economists had, uh, this is due to a uh, uh, famous economist who also got the Nobel Prize, Robert Solo from MIT, uh, is that as uh, technology progresses, uh, it, uh, it leads to uh, making workers more productive, but also machines more productive, right? Physical capital more productive, kind of in a proportional manner, right? So that means that if, to the extent that markets, right, this is one of the beliefs of uh, the current uh, established um, economic theory, is that uh, to the extent that a factor of production, an input of production becomes more productive, is able to capture a bigger share of the national income. Right, so if workers are more productive, then they can fetch a bigger slice of the uh, of the pie of the national income, and um, and so how, what we are what we can observe in the statistics is that uh, income in the United States and globally has become increasingly polarized in the last few decades. So that must be as a result of something in in the uh, in in the way technology has been progressing. Right? It has been favoring uh, higher skill over lower skill. What is, what is the uh, technology uh, that provides kind of a candidate for uh, explanation of this phenomenon? We're a digital technology, right? Digital te technology uh, to the extent that it uh, allows for the elimination of repetitive tasks, right? Because you can uh, delegate those functions to machines or to computers or to algorithms or software, then to that extent you don't need a person who is doing the same thing over and over and over again. Right? However, other kind of tasks, other kind of functions that require more creativity and social interaction and things like that, well, you cannot replace human labor yet. Right? So machines are, seem to be moving in that direction towards taking over uh, more complex cognitive tasks and to the extent that they can uh, you know, uh, amass and, and, and analyze large volumes of data, then that process uh, is speeds up. But, uh, so that means that the kind of workers that you need are workers that have those characteristics, that are more skilled, that are, you know, uh, uh, therefore capable of adjusting to this kind of technology. That's one of those explanations. Personally, I think that it's, it, the premises of all those studies are something that we should reject. Right, which again is this basic idea that private ownership is sacred. It's kind of like a natural fact of life. Right? No, pri there is no inherent reason why machines, why uh, uh, you know buildings, bridges, roads, etc., uh, and factories, right, workplaces, why they should be uh, held privately. Why they should, uh, uh, you know, uh, why the benefits of the use of these physical objects should be reaped only by the private legal owners, right? Actually taxing, right, in that sense fiscal policy, is a mechanism by which society as a whole, right, takes a claim over the fruits of, uh, of those physical objects. And so in, in a sense it's a curtailment of the, uh, of the right of, uh, rights of capital. Okay, let me uh, speed this up because uh, um, I want to touch upon other things, so of course, other other points that I listed at first. Yeah, the, the, the uh, technic, technological change as an aspect of uh, of uh, uh, labor cooperation. I don't really have much time to uh, explain myself clearly on this, but I uh, I want to just leave uh, this to drop this uh, here. The idea that ultimately technological change uh, reduces itself. Well, maybe reduces is not the right word, but I mean that 
that it builds on something that is rather simple. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, can be found, by the way, in, in Marx's capital, I think, personally. Uh, maybe we are projecting on Marx's capital a lot of our own uh, uh, beliefs and ideas, etc. But, uh, but I personally, in, the, in chapter 12 of volume one of Capital, um, there, uh, uh, Marx basically says that, you know, ultimately, uh, increases in productivity come from uh, workers sharing uh, means of production, right? So for example, right, like suppose that there is a, uh, there is a heavy object in this space here that, that uh, it's in our way. Right, so we need to clear it. I can come and try to push it, but it's too heavy. So my productivity is zero. However, if I invite other people to come and you know, we're gonna have to share this mean of, mean of production, it's an object of labor. We're gonna move it together and we communicate with each other and we coordinate our actions and we say we wanna move it that way. Then our productivity all of a sudden increases to one because we are able to move one physical object out of the way, right? So. Sharing means of production is, is, is something very rather simple, right? But it seems that all technological progress it can ultimately be explained in something so simple as sharing means of production. Now, to share a mean of production, right, it's something that uh, requires that the, the, means, the means of production in question be of sufficient size or amount. Um, what do I mean by this? Right? If you have a machine that is bigger, then probably two workers can work side by side. One worker manipulating one part of the machine and another worker manipulating another part of the machine. If the machine is small, then it's, that's something harder to do. Right? It's more fitting for an individual worker. Uh, so basically, the, uh, the size, the amount, uh, in the case of uh, means of production that, that are granular, right, is what allows for means of production to be shared, and therefore that's what allows for technology to improve in the sense of yielding a higher productivity. Right? Um, so it, it is, I insist, uh, an aspect of labor cooperation. I have a paper that I have submitted to a journal, but uh, it's uh, currently negotiating its publication, and it's precisely on this thing. Um, number three, number the point number three. Uh, technological change offers the change uh, offers the potential for human li uh, li liberation. Uh, I just uh, would like to uh, uh, stress that this is the potential that uh, that it's there is no necessity one way or the other. There is no basis to be pessimistic or to be optimistic. Basically, it really is up for grabs. Uh, and it, to the extent that we uh, that we want to uh, realize this potential, right? That we have the will and they have the we have the disposition to do it. Then we have to struggle for it. And um, uh, yeah, I have just one minute, um, and I, I'm going to stop right here to allow for uh, the audience to uh, engage. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to see if uh, if the Michaels would like to engage with each other or with me or uh, yeah. I thought it was interesting that the overlaps between the two papers here lead to some very interesting and actually commonsensical approaches. One. We hear that workers don't have enough training. Two, we know that they could get the training if they have $50,000 to go into universities. So if you did cancel some of the university debt, and student debt rather, let them get training. Another thing, the government doesn't have any money. It doesn't have any money because it gives tax write-offs and loopholes. And the amount of the tax loopholes equals the total amount of non-defense government spending. So the government could double its capacity to provide 
for things that are needed merely by shutting off a few of these loopholes. They're not going to be able to do it in this political environment unless we're here, unless we're there to push them in the right direction. But there's so many things that we could be doing, that we should be doing, and that we're not doing. And it's like we're in this, this car that's spinning out of control, and nobody knows how to put on the brake or to accelerate in the right direction. And I guess that's what the left forum meeting's about. I'd rather leave things open to discussion and talk about response to what I said. That's what the Confiscation of American Prosperity book was about. And um, what you can see is... Yeah, can you repeat, repeat the a, question? Am I, is this not loud enough? Can you repeat the question? We need to hear the question okay. What caused the shift from the golden age where we had high wages, high production, and increasing standards of living and a decrease in inequality. What changed? And really what you saw the buildup of this, when the Second World War was over, the first law passed was the Taft-Hartley Act. The growing strength of unions was seen to be a risk equal to that of the Soviet Union. And in many ways, I don't think they could distinguish between the two. Um, <clears throat> so you, you, they struck out after unions. They struck down uh, through the Supreme Court many of the good things that were being done. And at the same time, business had done very little to reinvest. One of the big problems in the economy was once the high wage era was over, there was very little incentive to invest in new machinery. And as you open up globalization, the options for financial profits started increasing immensely. That coupled with the third world debt, uh, I mean, the banks were known at the time that Michael Hudson was talking about as debt pushers. And it looked like there was tremendous profit in that. Of course, when they uh, it didn't work. The government had to step in and save the banks. Citibank was essentially bankrupt at the end of that period. And at the same time, what we saw was the Democratic Party, this is what Michael Hudson was talking about in Europe, which was supposed to be the Progressive Party, started moving farther and farther and farther to the right. So if you start with Roosevelt, it was no radical to begin with, and you look at the sequence of presidents, each Democratic president is worse than the last. From Roosevelt to Truman was a big step down. And then we continue and we look back and we see Bill Clinton as a liberal. What could be farther from the truth? And then Obama tops him. And now we have Hillary. The question is, how did financialization take over? And the answer is as much political as it is economic. And it's very largely the failure uh, of the left. Uh, in explaining fascism, 
Trotsky wrote that uh, the reason that fascism succeeded in Europe was the utter collapse of the Communist Party and the Marxist leadership. And uh, uh, at the time Hitler took power in Germany, one million uh, Communist Party members were under arms. Stalin told them to disarm. Uh, basically, he supported Hitler as he supported uh, as he opposed uh, the Marxists in Spain, uh, realizing that the spread of socialism outside of Russia would uh, immediately shift the whole focus of, of uh, socialism uh, away. Uh, and we all know uh, that led, th for the next 40 years, uh, much of the left, instead of criticizing capitalism, instead of looking where capitalism was going, uh, it had to criticize uh, the Soviet Union as a, a travesty of Marxism. And we, we know what the final stage of, uh, of uh, Stalinism is. It's neoliberalism. Uh, by 1991, when uh, Russia decided to privatize uh, its industry, uh, Russia was probably the only country in the world that had no background in Marxism. Uh, I saw, when I visited the uh, Soviet republics, I'd see capital and uh, Russian uh, or other la languages used as doorstops, as propping up uh, windows uh, when it rained. Uh, if, uh, if the Russians would have had any understanding of Marx, uh, especially volume two and volume three, they, never, they would have realized that when the ne neoliberals came and said, you know, we can make all of your party members rich, just uh, <clears throat> Register the, the red directors, the companies in your own favor. Register uh, uh, the uh, mines, the uh, Norils Nickel, uh, the electric utilities uh, in your own names. Uh, they decided that uh, Stalinism merged naturally into Thatcherism, uh, into privatization. Uh, and uh, the left had, didn't uh, follow all this. They knew that Thatcher was... Uh, uh, bad for uh, fighting uh, against other uh, labor unions, but the labor unions in uh, the winter of our discontent, when you had the coal miners in London uh, uh, just uh, having a general strike and paralyzing uh, the whole uh, country, uh, just got uh, uh, the British uh, labor so disgusted that it uh, thought anything has got, has got to be better than this uh, stagnation. They voted for Thatcher and then, of course, for the super Thatcher, Tony Blair, uh, and uh, the, uh, the subsequent part of the Labor Party. You've had the same thing here in the Democratic Party. Uh, and in the American left, uh, it was so uh, concentrated with anti-Stalinism uh, that most of the Trotskyists ended up uh, supporting uh, the, the Vietnam War and became the neocons. When I came to New York in 1961, uh, I used to have lunch every day, uh, every Thursday with Mac Shackman and Mike Arrington. And I was opposed when, uh, appalled when both of them thought that the, uh, uh, the Vietnam War was uh, a way to stop Stalinism. They uh, had made the same mistake that American foreign policy had, not distinguishing between uh, nationalistic uh, revolutions, not uh, of making a black and white uh, character. So uh, after that, the, uh, the Democratic Party and the left turned into the same identity politics uh, mm -hmm. that we had today. They fought for cultural issues, uh, ethnic equality, racial equality, sexual equality, uh, but there's been almost no uh, economic analysis, especially no financial analysis, uh, nothing about volume two and volume three, uh, not, uh, nothing about how capitalism is not turning out to be uh, the happy transition to socialism that Marx anticipated it would be, but something entirely different, that we're falling back into feudalism. So you could say that the problem today, uh, the greatest enemy isn't simply capitalism, it's feudalism. It's uh, in the sense of a rentier economy, uh, an economy where the economic surplus is stripped away uh, financially. Uh, basically by the banks uh, uh, taking their position and uh, uh, emptying out uh, industry. Uh, you, you have uh, the blame 
uh, uh, the victims are being blamed. And uh, when uh, the former two speakers talked about education, uh, obviously uh, people say on Wall Street, well, all the workers need to do is be better educated. And you had the head of Goldman Sachs come out recently and say, well, our people are paid the highest price in America, $22 million a year, I think, for the partners because we're so productive. Well, the question is, what is productivity? Uh, I want, uh, as many of you may know, I wanted to write my first uh, PhD dissertation at NYU of uh, concepts of productivity. Uh, the head of the National Bureau, Solomon Fabricant, the name is uh, for fabricating information and for fabricating statistics, uh, said you can't, that would be crazy because uh, we've uh, moved towards the present state of perfection that it's uh, nonsensical to talk about other ideas that were once held. If ideas used to be held and they're not anymore, it's because of the uh, struggle for existence and we've come to our current uh, state. So needless to say, I did not write, uh, I wrote my dissertation under, uh, 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 on American protectionist ideas. And when uh, Michael mentioned David Wells, David Wells actually was popularizing the ideas of Henry Carey and Erasmus Peshine Smith. Uh, and it was Peshine Smith who developed the idea of human capital, later, uh, later picked up uh, almost word for word by the Columbia University professor who claimed uh, he had invented it a hundred years later, uh, uh, taking this uh, uh, economy of high wage theory. Well, the fact is you don't need an education to, to make money at Goldman Sachs. All you need is greed. And that can't be taught in the business schools. Uh, so, you know, uh, they, miss, they miss the whole point. Uh, but the left has missed the point, too. Okay, uh, yourself, you're not ready. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll be with you, but here, here, and there, and there, and there, if time allows. Yes, please. Hi, um, my name's Susan, and I used to do human work on Vietnam, and I'm confused. I used to do a program called You and Your Money on Vietnam. You and Your Money. Yeah. And so I'm confused. I do taxes for a living. And I specialize in artists and lefties and people like me. I got over 100 calls this year from um, primarily youngsters, but people throughout, who are earning zero to ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. And it seems to me that the work, work has just totally diminished outside of STEM. So what I'm interested in is are you all saying that if we put in some sort of Marxist or some sort of other kind of system, work would flourish given um, technology? Because in my tax business, I can do the work with an assistant for two months of what it used to take four, five, six, seven people to do during the same time period. So I don't understand what confuses me, and I really appreciate what each of you said. It's, it's, it's like coming in and getting fed chocolates. You know, it's wonderful to hear this. But what I want to know, what confuses me, is how these analyses um, get us to getting any kind of pragmatic thing for now that we can push for. How can we get real work unless it's government mandated to get more teachers and stuff like that? Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what we're talking about are the blockages to uh, uh, the economy recovering. Uh, we're not coming, neither of us today, that would be another panel, uh, the way forward. What we're talking about is there cannot be a way forward. There cannot be capital investment in technology as long as the economic surplus is simply financialized uh, and used for asset acquisitions and mergers. Uh, most of what uh, uh, in the uh, information technology uh, that you mentioned uh, is uh, basically economic rent by the uh, uh, IT manufacturers. That's what the uh, trade uh, TTP, the Trans-Pacific uh, Agreement, is all about. How to lock in monopoly rent so that other countries will have as much of a uh, rentier overhead uh, as America uh, uh, to get this technology. Uh, I'd, uh, the technology issue is basically beyond what I'm saying, but Marx discussed this in volume two 
of capital. And when he's discussing uh, Ricardo, Ricardo said that technology was going to disemploy labor and uh, make sure that labor only had the minimum uh, wage. And Marx said, well, wait a minute, you have the capital goods industries, and it's true that technology will uh, raise productivity, uh, but in uh, technology will have two effects. It will make uh, it creative destruction, it will make the existing industrial capital obsolete, and so Marx developed and introduced into accounting theory the theory of obsolescence as part of the depreciation. And he said, but also there will be machine workers and the demand under uh, industrial capitalism for technology workers, uh, for the higher technology, will exceed uh, the amount uh, displaced. Uh, the first translation of uh, Theories of Surplus Value was made by my mentor, Terence McCarthy. Uh, published, uh, he published volume one under the uh, uh, history of econo title, History of Economic Doctrines. Volume two was set to come out, and the Stalinist, the Communist Party, sent uh, uh, saboteurs into the printing plant, poured acid over all the plates to prevent this because the Stalinist translation of Marx's Theories of Surplus Value replaced the concept of price with value uh, and uh, if, if uh, Marx's description of national income accounting was correct, then the Russian national income accounting turned out not to be Marxist, but based on Adam Smith, the distinction between physical labor and, and services. So, uh, you know, that was part, uh, the whole discussion on the left of technology has been uh, uh, conducted in uh, a most uh, un-Marxist way. Okay, um, I, uh, I don't have a, uh, quick reply to the question of, you know, what to do uh, right now that would make our lives easier, rather, other than struggling, you know, like uh, political fight, engaging in the political process, uh, uh, and uh, things like, uh, you know, altering uh, our economic policy, in particular fiscal policy, you know, the, a program of full employment, kind of FDR type. Uh, would benefit workers in the uh, relative short run if we are successful at pulling it off. And there is a, 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 I think that there are the conditions out there for people to coalesce around this kind of a political agenda. Uh, that, that, that's kind of a concrete, a very specific kind of a question and problematic that uh, I, I cannot address in, in a minute here. But uh, um, uh, without, without that, uh, if we remain fragmented, if we try to solve the problems individually, right, to, or creating like small uh, islands of cooperation where we try to shut off the rest of the world, uh, I am afraid that uh, that that may not uh, be the an effective solution to to uh, to uh, the, the problems we face. Um, okay, uh, let, let me uh, allow. <coughs> Another dimension of this, which is very important to keep your eye on, and that is the rapid rate of <clears throat> consolidation in industry. Nothing like this has happened since the late 19th century. You're seeing the airlines all merging almost into a single airline. You have four big airlines that cover everything. Pharmaceutical companies pick up the paper almost any day. You'll see one pharmaceutical company is taking over another. What this means is twofold. First, money, instead of being invested in better productivity or in higher wages, is used for these takeovers. Two, once you have the takeover, you don't have competition. Because you don't have competition, you won't get reinvestment. And <clears throat> so the economy will stagnate in that respect. And then finally, when you get consolidation, then your lobbying becomes even stronger. And it will be very, very hard to make political progress to displace the lobbyists in um, Washington. And what we see now is that the areas around Washington are the richest areas in the country. It used to be around Silicon Valley where they were at least producing something and now they're not producing something. They're building up rents. And the way what you do is you rent a congressman or rent a senator and you use those to build up the rents in your business. It's disgusting. Nobody's talking about that. Not even Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, who are light years ahead of the clowns that they're putting up mm -hmm. as candidates now. Actually, did okay, uh, the, the lady, the lady here, and then uh, gentleman here, and then you. Well, 
tell me if I'm talking loud enough. I have a teacher's voice when I'm up to this. I grew up in Washington, D.C. during the McCarthy era in the 50s. I attended uh, the University of Michigan, where Chandler Davis and the various people who admitted that they were communists were immediately fired. Chandler made a very interesting comment. He said, one of the things the McCarthy period did is it stopped people from talking in big terms, except those people who always talk about Stalinism, it comes out of your ears. Anyway, enough of it. Um, we, haven't talk, we, can, we don't talk in big terms. We don't talk in terms of real system change. We go at it here and here and here. The American people are very aware of the financialization of our economy and that they've taken over. It's almost like an octopus that's strangling us. And I think it's very important that we put that forward, that we talk about <coughs> nationalizing the banks. They're crooks. It's all in the newspapers all the time. <coughs> Ordinary people in this country know the banks are crooks. They know it. I'm a member of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. We just had our 100th anniversary. It's, and we're going to go, we're going to have a huge uh, uh, study of political economy. We just started on, on something like that. As long as we've been trying to stop wars for a hundred years, as long as W I L P F, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, as long as there's the profit motive, we are not going to be able to stop wars. So if you do loud and clear, even if you're ultra left, even if it seems silly, to talk about nationalizing the banks, the ordinary people on the street know the banks are killing us, know that the, that the financialization of our economy is strangling us. And you can go to, you know, closing loopholes. You can do, do something about the defense budget. Um, you can do something about minimum wages. It's all kinds of concrete things that can be done. But for God's sakes, don't be afraid about talking about nationalizing the banks. Take that away. We've got to start somewhere. We've got to start dismantling this whole financial system. And nobody's really talking about it that way. We're kind of tiptoeing around. I can tell you a little more about my background. I lived in the German Democratic Republic for a while on a sabbatical teaching man. I was in 1985, I had a sabbatical in, um, in England. And I lived through that minor strike and I saw everything that happened there. I have, I'm gonna be 80, I've lived through a lot. And it's about time that we just we went right for the jugular and we go right for the for the for the financial system and keep saying that over and over you will have the people with you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. um, the, the gentleman there. I'm sorry. Did you want to respond? Or? No, just very briefly. Okay. A lot of bankers would agree with you. Uh, they, what they're going to do is push the banks to the uh, uh, ultimate, uh, take the money and run, uh, give themselves the golden parachutes. Uh, the banks at a certain point are going to want to be nationalized. That's the big ripoff. That uh, somehow the kind of socialism we're going to get is not a democratic socialism, but oligarchic socialism, the opposite of socialism. Uh, the banks uh, in Europe uh, will be nationalized in in order to make all of their high uh, uh, their uninsured depositors whole, in order to make their bound holders whole. Nationalization today is a way of taking money from the public sector and uh, giving it to uh, the people that uh, Michael has described, the lobbyists in Washington, uh, who are writing the laws. Uh, my colleague Bill Black from the University of Missouri at Kansas City writes regularly on uh, naked capitalism uh, about uh, uh, how uh, the, the uh, bank crime. Uh, the bank crime will not be prosecuted uh, because of, of the, uh, the Obama administration. Based, Obama made a deal with uh, Robert Rubin uh, to support him uh, when he came in. And as long as the Democratic Party is run by the uh, Rubenomics group, the Demo uh, essentially uh, the bankers, uh, they cannot support the progressive ideas uh, that many of you who vote Democrat uh, believe in. Basically, uh, the, uh, the bankers have realized that by making the Democratic Party run on identity issues, on racial issues or feminist issues, uh, they can get away uh, with the theft uh, that they're doing. So there cannot be a progress in the United States until there's an alternative to the Democratic Party.
Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, I basically agree with most everything I've heard, and I appreciate your comments, which to me are fairly conventional, sort of Marxist, old school Marxist analysis. You know, uh, pretty tough, but it's basically old school Marxist analysis, which is great. The question I have is, what if you flip this a bit, because people live two sides of their lives. One is as workers, and the other is consumers. Traditionally, Marxists never look at the consumption side, the actual side in which people get exploited for, you know, from other ripoffs that are taking place every day. You touched on a couple, Michael Hudson, in terms of how uh, people's wages and et cetera, uh, how it was all exploited in terms of rent, interest rates, et cetera. But I'm curious if you guys would spend a couple of minutes in talking about the other side of the equation, that is the consumer scams, the ripoffs, and how that fits into your overall notion of what you call confiscation, because that's what most of us live with. I mean, we know this stuff. Okay, that's all. Okay, uh, before I do, when, when I sit down after a talk, I always remember that I had forgotten some of the most interesting parts. And I just wanted to read a quotation to give you an idea of the limitation of speech. And it's a quotation from George Stigler, who was probably smarter and in many ways more influential in terms of the political system than Milton Friedman, who's the two worked very closely together. This is George Stigler on the minimum wage. One evidence of the professional integrity of economists is that it is not possible to find a good economist who supports the minimum wage. That is, if you, if you support minimum wage, you're not a good economist and you're not even an economist. So we don't have to listen to you. This is the world we live in from, from the econ economic side. The consumer side, let me just say, in the early 20th century, there were people who were insisting that we should try to communicate with the workers and to see themselves not as workers, but as consumers. And there was a concerted effort in order to create that mindset. It wasn't accidental. And uh, it worked. It worked for them, but not for us. Oh, one other minor little thing I want to say. When uh, we were talking, someone mentioned about the importance of having a socialist movement. When I was an undergraduate, I spent an afternoon driving uh, an old man, uh, and his name was Norman Thomas. And one thing he said, you know, I started the New Deal. Roosevelt took all my ideas. And it was because it was a strong communist party, a strong socialist party, and instead we get Clinton and Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned that uh, our ideas seem to fit the classical Marxist mold. Uh, let me uh, uh, this say is this about. Criticism. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, but it, but it just uh, made me think about this. You know, I, it it seems to me that um, that all knowledge. Um, uh, it, it's a use it or lose it kind of thing, um, and, and there is a lot of uh, there is a there is a whole stock, there is a whole wealth of experience that has been synthesized by thinkers before us, you know, and Marxists have been some of them, and uh, and, and sometimes I wonder, uh, you know, uh, whether this. Uh, uh, fascination with novelty, you know, the, the, the things that shine, that attract our immediate attention and refocus our minds, you know, to, to, what, ex to what extent that represents a big loss of, uh, uh, you know, of knowledge that, that, uh, that has already been uh, developed. And, and, and so uh, I, I will just emphasize the point that knowledge has to be preserved in the sense, in a, in a sense it has to be reproduced, it has to be uh, re-acquired uh, almost at every point in time or at least by each generation and of course that this is a process that is critical, it's a critical appropriation of what exists 
but uh, uh, but it, that 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 is a a, a requirement, and uh, unfortunately, what the 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 punchline of what of this uh, is escaping me now. So I just go to the next person. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, you're right in a sense that uh, the uh, Marxists uh, have uh, emphasized uh, workers instead of consumers. Uh, look at uh, Mr. Obama's uh, uh, speeches uh, today. He said, uh, you know, forget your jobs. You can buy imports cheaper. Uh, wouldn't you rather buy a cheaper Chinese import and be unemployed? Sure you would. Uh, that's uh, Obama's speech in a nutshell. Uh, the idea is to, if you can convince them to think of themselves as consumers, they won't think of themselves as workers. But on the other hand, uh, uh, what's the main thing that uh, workers buy if you're thinking of consumption? The most important element of every family budget is the home. That's the one thing that uh, I've spent quite a bit of time in, also in East Germany and uh, Russia, and, and that's the one thing that the Soviet Union didn't supply. The one thing that people wanted was uh, houses. And, uh, uh, you know, even in the Hollywood movies in the 40s when Russia was our ally, they made fun of all the families having to live in the same apartment, uh, which is pretty much still uh, very often uh, the condition there. Why couldn't uh, Soviet communism give consumers the one thing uh, that they uh, they wanted more than anything else, their own apartment and a uh, 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 plot of land. Uh, they, uh, there was no market uh, feedback there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, within capitalism, Marx and every, uh, Marxists led the fight for the uh, uh, eight hour day and uh, succeeded. And the idea was that the, what consumers really want is leisure. They want their own time free of work. And instead of getting the leisure economy that almost all futurists talk about 100 years ago, you're having uh, to work overtime, you're having to work more and more intensively. Uh, the rise in productivity in America, very large, if you look at the statistics, does not flow from uh, more technology. It flows from making workers work longer and longer without pay, uh, and from squeezing more and more out of them more intensively. Output per worker goes up by, uh, uh, by the process of attrition and not uh, uh, not uh, replacing them, uh, they've uh, lost control of the uh, uh, of the workplace uh, in this country. So uh, the whole uh, concept of consumption has to be uh, broadened. Yes. Okay. Just I will just take one minute. It, uh, it came back to me. The, this is all knowledge, actually. It's in Marx in Grundrisse. Consumption is an aspect of production. Right. Ultimately, what production means is the production of ourselves. Right. So, I, you know, the production of machines is just a roundabout way of producing ourselves because we use machines to produce things that eventually at some point we're going to consume and the consumption of these things is the production of ourselves, the production of our bodies, etc. And, and so, uh, in, in, in that sense, all Marxism is not ignoring the question of consumption. It's just like, uh, when, you, when you think about it, right, uh, because Conventional economics pays a lot of attention to consumption, and they, they have this concept, this notion of consumer sovereignty, right? That consumers are the ones that decide how resources are allocated in our society. So if people want like whatever, that's what that whatever is what you know Free investors choice. are going to invest on, and they're gonna you know switch labor towards us. Um, but uh, I, I'm gonna interrupt my answer because I see a lot of hands, uh, and uh, we have very limited time. So instead, I'm gonna allow for uh, the gentleman back there, and then I come here. Uh, I'm trying to follow the sequence in which people raise their hands. Yes. Can, can you raise your voice, please, Speak so up. that people can hear you? Okay. So you, I think it was you that mentioned uh, recruitment and, uh, you know, talking about, uh, as you put it, uh, uh, skill shortages as a problem being BS. In my recollection of the recruitment column, or maybe a couple of that, mentioned was in, in the sense that um, that he, he claimed that it was uh, not true because uh, he contested the fact that we need to have wage increases to cover skill shortages if in fact there were genuine skill shortages. But uh, a closer reading of that suggests, however, that group may not necessarily be entirely accurate because it is an issue of increased cost to employers. If employers, for example, do not raise, 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 um, raise wages, but on the other hand, provide bonuses to you know, fellow employees to recruit people, uh, 
for example, the, uh, there are increased costs to uh, employers themselves. So I guess the interesting question is, uh, wages aren't necessarily a totally satisfactory metric uh, for measuring the skill shortages. And if you're just simply relying on that, uh, I don't think that you necessarily have, have a good argument to make with respect to whether, in fact, the skill shortages are going to make the I mean, that's, that's my point. <coughs> Uh, and uh, you know, I think the other, the other thing, quick thing I'd like to make a comment on, the comment was made about how, uh, of course, it's true, tax expenditures, uh, in fact, uh, are so fast that they may, I don't know if they actually cover the non-defense budget, but they're, they're, they're fairly fast. But yet, on the other hand, you make a comment about how in this country and in other countries, home ownership is very important. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is politically, the mortgage interest deduction is an extremely important to the, uh, the tax structure because people want to own their own homes, and that provides a way for people to make home ownership more affordable. So if you have that situation, uh, you, you, I mean, on the one hand, you talk about, well, let's do this, but on the other hand, in fact, that there are political realities with respect to why we have certain tax exemptions. Whether that's right or wrong, there are political to those arguments. That's my comment. Okay, I'll just answer the group more part and then you deal with it. Uh, okay, the, it, um, uh, but the point that Krugman makes is, you know, there is this story about, you know, uh, right now there is this mismatch between uh, uh, the needs of industry, the kind of talents that are required from the labor force, and the, the talents and qualifications of the labor force. Therefore, we have to have unemployment, right? However, he says, the same story was told after during the Great Depression, and yet, what happened uh, afterwards was the Second World War. And so, this idea that, for example, women are not fit physically, whatever, right, genetically, to participate in in, in the labor force, you know, to work in the factories, etc. Well, you know, just uh, uh, just a few months later, those women were turn, turning out tanks and you know so uh, that just falsifies this notion that that the problem is you know is structural in that sense that that we we should allow for unemployment to uh, to prevail when it's possible to introduce uh, you know without wars right hopefully Keynesianism but without w militarism right uh, yeah that, that would be a, a, an adequate response in the short term Re regarding home ownership and the uh, uh, deductibility of interest. Uh, the economy's uh, drowning in junk economics, and it's sponsored uh, very much by the University of Chicago, as Michael points out. Uh, the, probably uh, the worst aspect of junk economics in America is uh, the, what the bank lobbyists have promoted, that the idea that homeowners benefit from the tax deductibility of interest. Uh, what that does, by making mortgage interest tax deductible, you merely leave more of the uh, real estate rent to be paid to the banks. The beneficiary of uh, lower, uh, deduct uh, uh, more affordable uh, uh, mortgage payments is the banks. Every dollar that's cut in uh, taxes paid uh, to either uh, real estate taxes or for mortgage interest, ends up freeing more rent to be pledged to the banks, and they're, uh, they're paid as, as interest, not as taxes, and this uh, creates a tax shortfall that then is used uh, to cry havoc and say, we've got to tax workers more, we've got to raise uh, the income tax in the lower brackets, and we've got to increase uh, sales taxes to fund uh, to finance the fact that uh, cities and municipalities no longer are getting uh, 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 the taxes and uh, that the banks are ending up with this. So there has to be an, uh, a tracing the incidence of taxation uh, in the, and uh, uh, this idea of cutting mortgage interest is sponsored by the banks and sponsored by the real estate interests uh, that get money and capital gains from uh, banks lending more money against the property and capitalizing the tax write-off. One, I couldn't resist saying that there have been economic studies that seem pretty solid that say where you have home ownership, unemployment is higher. I remember when I was young, I was driving through West Virginia and seeing all these displaced coal miners sitting on their porches with nowhere to go because they couldn't afford to sell their house. 
I know when a tornado went through Youngstown, Ohio, my brother called on the phone and was almost in tears. He said, it missed my house by a goddamn hundred yards. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that the, he, would, he would have gotten the insurance. Uh, another thing is with robots, what you were talking about is very interesting. But uh, the way to handle the unemployment from robots is you reduce the working day that Michael was talking about. You reduce the working day, and that creates more intellectual capacity if, it's, if the situation is correct where the workers then have time to create the human capital, which is a ridiculous concept, um, to get a job. And uh, it would be a much healthier economy, and you'd have people being able to take care of their children and raise them better without the stresses and excess of work. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. It, it, uh, time is up. I just want to take one second to thank uh, Franz, uh, your piece, uh, Francis Boyes, for solving the uh, vexing uh, sound problem. Thank you.